Michelle Zappa. Are you with us on audio as well? I can see you. Hey, yes, I, I, can, I can see you, I can hear you, can hear me? Perfect. Loud I want to challenge the assumption that there is an after. <laughs> there is an as after. As in like, well, this is the after. This is the after, yeah. Well, for some. I don't think. <laughs> well, Somewhere yeah, in the some. middle of it right now. Somewhere in the middle. Yeah, but I think, uh, yeah, and I think I, I, I expect this to be in the extended state of things for the foreseeable future. And, and any attempt at going back to any form of normality will probably be met by sort of natural resistance. And I think people who are most frustrated, some of those who are most frustrated with what is going on tend to be the ones who are not sort of, who want to go back to how things were before. And that tends to go hand in hand. So it's dangerous to, to hope things will ever go back. Um, and I think, yeah, sorry to. No, that was an incredible um, breaking point or, or the introduction because uh, Michelle, you are a futurist and a technology, technology advisor, correct? And um, you're also uh, one of the thinkers. We have a lot of thinkers in our network and I'm very grateful for that because your mind goes always outside the box. Um, but you're also a founder and the CEO of Envisioning. Would you um, please tell us a bit more about what you do uh, in the Envisioning? Sure. And, um, yeah. Sure. I mean, Envisioning is, is an attempt to make sense of the emerging future by looking at technology. So we've, uh, and we've, we, we do a lot of work in data visualization and sort of, sort of strict and heavily method, methodological research. So the way we do this is we all acknowledge that there's a ton of technologies going on around the world or being developed. Um, everywhere. And oftentimes it might feel sort of unoverviewable how much is going on, where is it happening, how ready is it, who's working on it, how impactful is it. So what we've been doing for a few years now is we're trying to build tools around making sense of that shift. So technology, technologies are happening. There's, there's very, very little we can do uh, sort of to push against the tide. But what we thought we could do is build interfaces, databases, um, really tool, like online and offline tools that help us make sense of what's going on. Which are the technologies? Who's working on them? How ready are they? How quickly are they adv uh, advancing? Um, how impactful might they be? We're, we're really like literally adding metrics to all of these things and building our own sort of methodology where these uh, changes can be tracked, identifying what is the technology, what isn't, um, how do we disambiguate things? How do we scale up the process? Uh, but we're trying to make sort of large scale sense of the technological ecosystem. And then of course, offer that to the world for free because that's what you should do. Um, so we, we, we supply, we work primarily with mostly with governments and, but also some corporations. Uh, we do a lot of so-called horizon scanning where uh, we might look at a sector or an industry um, that is uh, affected by technology and then identify um, the, the sort of the key technologies that are most likely to affect that particular industry or sector or business. And most of that work uh, is then published freely um, as, a, as a way of um, bringing back whatever we can to, mm -hmm. to the community. And by the community, we mean anyone interested in technology, which which is a growing number of people. Mm -hmm. So, Supporting the open source community then. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot the best, to, ask you. to To the best of our abilities, yeah. Most of the content is licensed with Creative Commons. Uh, the source we want to make, uh, we're, we're working on making even more open as well, but open source in both in principle uh, and in practice, yeah. Well, you're asking for links. Or, yes, we are asking yeah, so, all things. Um, also, do you have a presentation that you want to share a screen um, or? I can show, yeah, if you can, if you can toggle the screen share, I can pull up the, um, okay. the tool that we just launched. So the theme of the, of the day is mostly around cities um, because we recently launched an experiment as an attempt to consolidate everything I've been talking about in sort of in, in the form of a tool. So most of our work, as mentioned, is, is, is for sort of large entities, but we, we, we decided to pick a theme that we all identify with that we want sort of envisioning to sponsor um, moving forward. And we chose cities because we all live in cities and we think cities um, have a lot of technologies affecting them. And uh, we did a deep dive into a few domains, as we call it, uh, such as civic engagement. So the technologies affecting how we make decisions, uh, governance, um, logistics, mobility, 
and security. And the interface, this is sort of meant to be looked at at your own pace. So it's not ideal for screen sharing. That's why the, the link um, is both in the comments and sort of here in the URL. So if you go to cities.envisioningio.io, uh, you'll pull this up. And um, what this is, is the equivalent of a report or a small encyclopedia of technologies that can, can somehow affect uh, cities in this case, such as brainwave signatures um, or something more pedestrian uh, or more ready, uh, harassment, real-time mapping, facial recognition, technologies that are more here, uh, real-time crime mapping, etc. So each one of these entries uh, represents a technology and, the techno and, and technologies exist at different levels of maturity or readiness as we call them. Um, that's what we've indicated here. It's the reason we put this into an infographic and not a report. So you'll see that the labels TRL one to uh, up to nine, TRL means technology readiness level. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a few ways of representing it, but basically it means that we can take this data set where each, each entry has been um, sort of assessed by its degree of maturity or its readiness. And then we can do things like present the research around the readiness level and go from science fiction to science fact. Because the lower the number, the lower the TRL, the less ready it is, the more of a concept or of, a, or of an idea it, it still is. So the brainwave signature we pulled up earlier um, is still a TRL3, which means it's applied, it's applied research. It's, it's, it's come out of the books and from out of the TV uh, and it's moving into the labs, but it's still applied research. How Whereas the algorithm is so low? It's automated. So that's it's automated voting. We we okay. were I mean, as in like it's it's algorithms that uh, automatically discern what you might want to do as opposed to doing it yourself. Um, so it's a bit different from from just it's, I mean our voting would be full TRL. We've had it for for a few uh, millennia, but um, but when when automating it or when making sort of uh, uh, when the machine is making decisions for us based on what they think we want, that's thankfully still quite low, uh, but creeping up. And um, we can compare that to something that is much higher on the readiness or that is fully, fully developed, such as wireless parking sensors, uh, urban vehicle restriction policies. So this is meant to, to represent sort of the range of, uh, of maturity levels that, that exist because when you're making a public policy decision, uh, we think it's useful for people to know of the technologies that are sort of moving in our general direction and how ready they are, because you might pick up something, like if you've never seen a wireless parking sensor, it might sound like science fiction that you can have a real time map of like where all the cars are uh, in, a, in a closed environment, for example. But if you've rolled out this technology, then you know that it's real. Um, but things that sound like science fiction that are actually here, um, as opposed to things that are science fiction, but that sound like they're here. So emotion controlling implants, still very low on readiness, uh, still being st uh, prototyped at small scale, but it exists. Mm. Uh, from the moment that it's conceived of in sort of in a novel um, or in a research report, from the moment that it's created um, in our minds, it, it already exists. And then it develops over time um, Companies start working on it. Um, startups start figuring it out. Uh, every entry is sourced, of course. So we we back we back up our uh, our wild uh, ideas of what's going on in the world, um, and uh, we we cite our sources down here. And um, but what it's what this is meant to do is really offer people who possibly have very little experience in tracking technologies. We want to offer them an interface where they can sort of do a deep dive and see what's already out there. What's being worked on? How ready is it? Who's doing it? Where is it happening? It's still incipient. Um, for example, at some point, we want to be able to compare cities. Um, we want to be able to offer uh, cities or even individuals sort of the ability to score these technologies. Oh, it's happening in my city, I, you know, such and such. Um, so we haven't gotten there yet. We're still sort of scratching the surface to figure out, is this useful? Um, do people in the public sector um, see purpose uh, and a role for, for, for these types of tools? And if they do, how can we make it even more useful? Um, and the best way to do that is you give it away and, and try making people uh, find out about it and give it a, sh you know, give it, give it a shot and, and see if they find uh, use for it in, the, in their organizations. I'm really curious, how did that all start? How did you came from 
you know, where you started to this? Uh, I'll show you actually. So let me do this. I'm going to pull up a different, um, a different URL here on screen. Um, so this literally, oh, hang on. And another question, is there still yeah. like a Google spreadsheet that you have to operate with, like a huge database full of all those the rows and <laughs> columns? Or oh, is this we used, we used yes and no. I mean, so we still use spreadsheets behind the scenes for a lot of uh, modeling. So every radar began, or most radars began as spreadsheets at some, or as literally as Google Sheets. It has an API you can export uh, the the JSON. I mean, it's you can plug it straight into the backend. It it breaks very easily, but 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 it's but yeah, most of our radars began as spreadsheets, mm -hmm. and then um, but and we still model some upcoming work as spreadsheets as well because we thought it's the it's it's it's, it's a quick way uh, to 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 do this. But we also have our database nowadays. So we've, we've sort of designed a, uh, a database that allows us to, uh, to do this sort of, this sort of tracking. Um, here, I found the image I was looking for. Um, we, we, we have a database that allows us to do this type of tracking. Um, I can pull it up as well on screen. So this is how it began. So you literally asked, this was in 2011. I still had a normal job uh, at the time, uh, but, I, but I was interested in Sort of making sense of technology, and I had been spending a lot of time putting together a keynote um, that became overwhelming. Like it was no, no one's going to watch my 400 slide keynote. So I said, turn it into something that is more, where I was trying to make sense of the stuff I saw going on in tech. Um, I said, I, I figured I'm going to turn it into something that is more palatable um, and uh, more visual. So that's how this infographic came around. Um, so a decade ago, these were the technologies that I saw on the horizon at the time. And I made it look, you know, um, readily consumable and easy to understand. But this con this concentrates a bunch of books, articles, uh, patent like theories, ideas of of the things that were visible at the time. And um, the visual logic remains exactly the same. We've experimented experimented with a, with many other ways of presenting the data. But today, it's still like, literally like the closer to the center, the more ready. The larger something is, the more impactful it is. So we've, we've, we've kept that, but of course built out um, the digital infrastructure that allows us to both visualize the data and, and track it with uh, more efficiently. Because this, of course, this is static, right? It's just an image. You can mm -hmm. hang it on your wall, but you can't click mm -hmm. anything. If you, wanna, if you wanna know what a memorister is, you have to type it into Google. So we, we went out of our ways over the last well, decade really to fix those underlying issues, to, but to, to so in many ways come back to exactly the same point, which is, Make it readable, make it comprehensible, uh, understandable by people, hopefully. And um... we have we have a bit of a um, problem here because uh, this is so interesting that we're going to be hijacking your presentation. Just saying, uh, Magda is also having a very interesting question, and that is, um, we all know that, for example, the U.S. the government uh, likes to test technology in the defense space. Now, how can innovators and creators ensure that these technologies are not weaponized against vulnerable communities? That is a very, very important question. Yeah, the short answer is you can't. Um, as in like most technology happens, is developed in defense. Um, if you pick up your smartphone, uh, 80, 80, 80 to 90% of those technologies were created by DARPA. DARPA is the research mm -hmm. arm of the US Army. Um, like the internet, GPS, touchscreens, all of that be began at DARPA. So it's kind of hard to, to get around. And, and one of the things we're trying to do is to sort of remove some of the sheen or the impression that technology is, is, um, is always for the best uh, and always a problem solver. I mean, of course, that isn't, that's no longer the case. I think we've collectively come to that realization, especially after 2016. Uh, like, oh, social networks, you know, they might have some issues. And I think we, we're realizing, we're increasingly reala realizing that. Um, but the problem is technologies are made, largely speaking, like the fundamental deep tech is mostly made at government level because no one else can afford it. No VC, no invest, like no one can pull off the cost of building an internet. So what you get is things with really quick returns, like delivery services. Um, they're not deep tech, they're not exciting tech, they're profitable tech. Um, and then they take over, you know, chunks of the world and which might not be ideal. So and that also goes back to our purpose, which is by making, by, by giving 
you know, by creating ways of accessing more reliable data on tech, we hope pe more people will, will realize its implications and sort of make better decisions around it and rely less on the Ubers and WeWorks of the world and more on sort of what about all the other technologies you're not familiar with mm -hmm. that, are, that are probably better solutions to the underlying issues you're facing? Can you name some? Just to bring more clarity uh, to that? Uh, it's a good question. I mean, it's it's hard to single something out. Um, as in, I mean, the, let's put it this way. Technologies that are very successful are also usually very detrimental. I mean, they're successful on the behalf of someone. Um, in the city I live, Sao Paulo, we have considerable discussions around the, you know, the the, the ethics of deli delivery applications. It's a big city, um, and there's a lot of wealth disparity, which means it's very convenient to have someone drive things for you around town, and people use, you know, use it with no uh, regard of the of the implications of it. So then they have a pushback. So like, so that's it's a very it's a, it's a micro example of something that I think represents something larger, which is. The, the hidden externalities of all of these technologies, like Facebook moderators suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, like that's a thing uh, mm -hmm. because there, someone has to look at all those photos that are filtered. Mm -hmm. That's not AI. And if AI is doing it, it's because someone trained the AI. So someone has to look at those horrible, horrible, horrible things that people upload uh, and that, that are somehow filtered. And that's, it's a hidden externality. You don't see it. Uh, you just see the shining, uh, easy interface of uploading pictures and seeing other people's pictures, but like there's all these hidden uh, human costs in in the midst that um, are not necessarily visible. I don't know. I, I don't think I answered your question. But. You definitely led us in the very interesting direction. There's also another question. Um, feel free to answer or not. Um, but a question is, how do you go about with the governments? Um, or, you know, what's your protocol? Do they come to you or do you approach them as part of the business development or, um, I mean- Bit of both. No secret, Bit of both. both. I mean, no, there's no secrets. We, we, we work in the open, like all of the work, we, we've done a poor job publishing our work in the past and we're fixing it. We've mm. done a good job doing the work and actually getting it delivered and, you know, making mm. rent and all these difficult things of running a business. Um, but, um, but people find us because our work is mostly open. So someone sees it, says, oh, this is useful. Uh, let's try doing something for ourselves. Um, so m virtually, I mean, all the public work, like every single project we've done for a government is on the web. It's not terribly findable right now. It will be a week or two from now because we're, we're improving some of our pipes uh, with our website and things. But, um, but it's, it all goes back to the web. So that's one of the ways that we show that there isn't anything um, there's nothing private and there's nothing secret in the work we do. What we do is we do a lot of desk research, finding the things that are out there um, and make them sort of readable because some of these innovations, they're in a patent applications, others are on a Kickstarter, others are the startup in you know, God knows where that's being worked on. Um, what, what we've built is this process and the tools, but mostly the process for making sense or for, um, for like, putting these findings into a funnel and making them homogenous and organized and orderly and tagged and categorized and evaluated. So in that process, we, we know what's out there, but we're not finding things that other people couldn't find. Like none of our findings um, are private to us, so to speak. Um, it's all on the web. We're just organizing it to, to some extent. Um, and whatever we do goes back to the public as well. So all the government work, all the horizon scanning, there's nothing, there's nothing secretive in it. There's nothing that we wouldn't want to show. Um, even our most controversial um, collaborator is in defense, but we don't do defense related work at all. So we've never looked at defense technologies, uh, mostly because they have really good suppliers doing that for them. What we do is like, we look at science fiction, we look at uh, human machine interfaces, we look at things that are more let's say edgy or more out there, um, we could not point you in the way of a drone manufacturer because that's really truly not what we're good at. Uh, but we can tell you which, which technologies were cited in, in a movie like 2001 A Space Odyssey and show how ready they are today. So I'll pull that up on screen. Uh, um, yes, please. <laughs> that's, that's more, that's, it's a more, yeah. sorry. Uh, go No, no, go for it. Um, I'm just going to be a bit mindful of our time because we have 10 more minutes to go. 
And I would very much like to ask you the final question from my side, and that is, um, since you're a futurist and you already seem to be in the future, from my perspective, how do you describe your future, like five, ten years? Do you have a plan or do you have a vision for that? I mean, I suppose so, because you are envisioning. Um, but yeah, I definitely want to learn more about that, too. I think our awareness of technology has shifted significantly, like in the past few years, and I, I don't see that slowing down. So. Um, I think a great example is something like um, The Social Dilemma on Netflix. It's a conversation that has been picking up steam for a few years now, which is like, how, do you, how, do you, how, how can you be more mindful around technology? Uh, how can you see the implications of you know, sharing something with no limits? Um, our elections here in Brazil were affected to a degree by WhatsApp because people could forward chains and images and links and you know whether it's true or not is beside the point. They could forward it to as many people as they wanted. Uh, now you can't anymore, but only after. So like so the 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 like the the effects technology can have uh, go beyond what we anticipate often, and I think more and more people are realizing it uh, on a personal level. Like oh, I'm spending too much time on my phone. Uh, but also collectively, like, oh, the, you know, the way my tone on Twitter might be misconstrued. Um, I think it's opening up space to be more mindful of these things. Um, so I, I see that, that shifting. So, I mean, the, the expression, like, vote with your wa wallet or vote with your feet uh, of the technologies you use, I see that happening more, um, which goes hand in hand with the Facebook backlash and a Google backlash as well. You know, I think people are realizing, like, this is not, these are not the people I want hoarding my data. What are they doing with it? Well, they tell us, they sell it for ads, but I think understanding the implications of that, I think more and more people are just wary of. It used to be, there used to be pockets um, of, of people who were extra cautious with their privacy. And like you have places in the world where historically people are more mindful of um, who has access to your data. Um, Switzerland comes to mind, Berlin comes to mind for historical reasons. And now that mentality is exporting, I think uh, considerably. So just understanding what happens if you do something, like if you, like what happens with all this time you spend online? Uh, I think people are more aware of it. I'm leaving a digital footprint out there. Yeah, this is, I mean, we all are, right? And, and like, and understanding what that is, I think is, is uh, I think more and more people uh, appreciate it. This is, this is what we do for defense. Um, this is, we take a movie or, or, or and a few films, sorry, and a few uh, other titles. Uh, and we break down the technologies that were in it and say how ready it is now. So the empathetic uh, AI, if you want to call HAL empathetic, but uh, we take that technology and assess how ready is it now using the same scale as we did in cities. So, well, at the time this was done in 2018, um, it was still at sort of TRL2. It's still um, a, a, th a concept or application. Whereas, th at, you know, when the movie came out 50 years prior, it was... Um, for seen to be there in 2001, but then 2001 came, you know, came, uh, came and went, and this technology still isn't there. Whereas something like your voice print identification um, that is used in the film is fully developed, or the tablet, which was, you know, the, the story is these were actual back projection screens wired into the table so that it looked like a tablet. That's the way they. That's the way Kubrick sure. filmed it, but because there was no such thing as LCDs at the time. But um, but this, of course, we all have well, we we, we all have access to 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 something as trivial trivial as a tablet. But at the time, um, they you know they went through all that trouble to to create it. So so that's 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 what we try to do. We try showing that technology exists on this scale of readiness of maturity, and the scales the scale will change over time. The maturity will change over time. Um, but we try representing that in different ways through our work. That is incredible. Um, and again, it's uh, very easy for me <laughs> to weave to another speaker, uh, just because, I mean, the TRL, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but that is technology readiness level. Yes? Yeah. So yeah. our next speaker is going to be Aaron Wright, and he's already with us, and he's going to be telling us more about the legal infrastructure for DeFi and DAOs. And just previously, uh, we were talking about the cryptocurrencies as well. So, I mean, this is all very much interconnected. Um, and my, I mean, my mind goes towards if we are um, posing the, the risk or if there is a risk of um, capturing and creating decentralized bases, just like, for example, Google has one, right? And we are all becoming more and more aware of what the privacy risks for us are. 
Um, are we also going to be more invested into the decentralization and then uh, creating these autonomous organizations that are fit um, or, um, you know, are more suitable we, or more aligned with our ethical standards? Or how do we go there? You're, you're asking, okay. So uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm yeah, no, I just wanted to be sure. <laughs> Look, so it's, it's also the link to the next to the next theme, but my, my own two cents on it is, um, I think, look, I don't see Google growing. Mm -hmm. I don't see Facebook growing anymore. That's, if they do, they're gonna grow on the backs of things that might not be in line with what they need. It's just gonna be more users um, shoveling their services to people who might not need it, want it, or make the best case, use of it. Um, and because I see people being more concerned about their digital footprint, as you said, um, and, and the implications of, of the tech. Whether that's, you know, whether the DAOs uh, or other ICO experiments are gonna move us in that direction remains to be seen. I haven't seen, I know there's there's a lot of proof of concepts around DAOs, um, and, but I haven't seen anything working. I might've interacted with something that's autonomous and never noticed, but I still see humans as being very much in the loop at all stages. We try automating our, our, our way away from, from people, but it's that's not the direction it's moving in, and uh, and personally, the way the way I see it, for our company at least, is how can we augment the people we work with with tools rather than replace them? I think that's the only sensible um, direction, is and you know enrich their ability, make them work better, faster, and less, um, rather than mm -hmm. like have it replaced by an AI. Also, AI is very very expensive. Uh, humans are still. <laughs> Like if, if you know how to work them, it's, 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 it's more efficient, it's faster to, to this day, at least for the things we do. Um, and I think AI is, I saw this great piece, it's like, it's, it's more of a cult than a technology. It's a cult, as in like, it's a, the cult of automating our, our problems away with ML. Um, it's more like this set of beliefs and then you, people try realizing it through technology rather than a definitive tech. So I, I still, I don't know, sure is still out. Amazing. Such a nice way to end it up. Um, does anybody here also have any questions for Michel? Magda, go for it. I know you have plenty. <laughs> I, we have to unmute you. It's in the okay. it's in the chat. I was just asking, um, and and it's not just for Michelle, it's for uh, any of the innovators who are on here. I think that there's a there's some sort of weighing that is happening in the world right now, weighing between the pros and cons of technology during COVID. And I saw the specific ones that I'm interested in kind of hearing thoughts about are the ones that we've seen in the media. Uh, during COVID. So the first one is contact tracing that we've seen a lot out of China and, um, and Singapore. Uh, the second is robots interacting with people who are out, um, you know, they're ro drones above, but robots also on the ground. Drones in, in, in Spain, for example, that said, you know, please disperse. Uh, and then robots on the ground kind of you know, scrolling around in Tunisia going, please disperse. And then, you know, finally, these kind of health sensors that I'm seeing more and more in the U.S., uh, where people walk through in in transit, um, you know, for for example, in mass transit systems, they walk through, they get kind of scanned with this blue light, and then they also get a little reading, a little printout. Um, there's a company I forget the name out of uh, Long Island, New York, uh, that does this kind of. It looks like a, a regular uh, scanner that you walk through at the airport, but it gives you a printout of your like blood pressure and your oxygen, and and so the question is, you know, are they keeping this data? How do you feel about mm -hmm. this? And this goes beyond privacy, I think. Um, it, you know, there's security issues. And so, you know, these are the, the kinds of regimes that have this, this information. How are you guys seeing um, these kinds of things evolving? From a legal perspective, I'm a lawyer. I'm interested in, in knowing kind of what innovators are thinking about as they're looking at these technologies. Yeah, I think the concern, as 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 you were talking about when I joined, uh, when I started listening in about an hour ago, was the the lag between um, between um, legislation and what technology is capable of doing. So I think that lag is the most treacherous thing, because to some degree, and I think the summit exists for us to start anticipating some of those issues and reduce the lag and the gap. But I think that lag is the most dangerous thing because it's exactly in that space that um, 
well, that at least that, that the tech companies um, um, lawyers work on, so to speak. I mean, their lobbyists are ensuring that that lag is as suited to the company's needs as, as legislation can be, um, I think. So I think it's in the interest of the population to know of these technologies and to know of the, like, again, I think the implications of them. So I personally don't, don't mind my blood pressure history being publicly available, so to speak. Um, but I think people should be aware of what's being tracked and by whom and for how long. As I think that, 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 that awareness um, needs to go into law because that's how you ensure that people who are not aware of it are at least not affected by it or, or affected positively. Um, so I think that, that's where I would strike the balance to, to, to reduce that gap. I'm happy to hear that because I feel the same way and I'd love to hear if somebody else has something to say about it. And I'd also like to just point out, yeah, usually we're, we're not kind of troubled about it, um, blood pressure or a little innocuous, what we think is innocuous information being shared, but what happens if they then use that to determine if you can get a life insurance policy or if you're allowed to have healthcare coverage fully, you know? So those are the things I think that we're all grappling with and it's, it's gonna be interesting to hear. I see Aaron is showing up on the screen, what he has to say as well. Thank you.